Mike Hughes here, preacher for the Spring Hill Church of Christ at 405 Butler Street, Spring Hill, Louisiana with another video Bible sermon for your edification and to build you up in the most holy faith, in the Word of God, the inspired Word of God, the pillar and the ground of truth where we find our standard for living and how we are hoping to obtain heaven as our eternal home after we leave this life. If you haven't already, go to the video description and download the note card for this sermon. Go get your Bible. Open your Bible. How many of you have a Bible? I hope you have a Bible. Get a good translation. Open it up. Study with us. If you find the things that we present are from the Word of God, Make whatever changes in your life you need to make before it's everlastingly too late. If you like this message, then give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. Ring the bell to get notifications of when we'll add new content. And so, with that in mind, let's jump into this video. Greetings, friends. Thank you for getting this lesson, watching this lesson, listening to this lesson. And we invite you to pay close attention, get your Bible, follow close, see if the things that we're teaching are true. If they are, make proper application uh, in your life. It seems typical of all people to sink instead of rise. That's true in the church as well as outside of the church. Now, let me illustrate what I'm talking about. It's easier to expect the worst from people than expect the best from them. It's easier to surrender to bad motives than it is to develop good motives. We find it easier to be critical than it is to encourage, easier to judge than it is to be compassionate, easier to resent people than it is to praise people. Easier to condemn someone than to forgive someone. Easier to be selfish than it is to be unselfish. And Jesus, he expects the best from us. If he, people expect the worst from us, Jesus still expects the best from us. If we expect the worst from ourselves, Jesus still expects the best from us. Every day he challenges us to find the strength and guidance in him to be the best person we can be. It is in that expectation that lies the conflict and the challenge. All of us enter Christ leaving an ungodly existence. Even if we enter Christ from the environment of a Christian home, quote unquote, we are still leave environments. We all still leave environments that are less than perfect, environments that have degrees of ungodliness. When we enter Christ Jesus, Jesus says, to us, I want you to find the strength and guidance in me to become what I know I can make you. Then the struggle begins. It becomes easy not to grow. It's easy to be content with who and what you are. It's easy to compare yourselves to people who do not even try to be godly, to feel good about who you are. It's easy to compare yourselves to Christians who made mistakes to feel good about who you are. It's hard to accept Christians who are different as being Christians also. If they have a different culture, if they come from a different social level, if they have different backgrounds, if they have different traditions, 
it is difficult to accept and to relate to them in Jesus Christ. It's hard to build a sense of community, a sense of belonging. Thus brings us to this third lesson in this series, skip over scriptures. Looking at Romans 16 in these first four parts, and the idea of building this sense of community, this sense of belonging, is a significant concern in Romans as it is in Galatians. It's hard to build an entirely new sense of belonging among people who never associate with each other in the past. Many Jewish people who became Christians had serious problems accepting and relating to non-Jewish people who became Christians. In Palestine, they lived in near complete isolations, maintaining as little interaction as possible with non-Jews. Outside of Palestine, in the dispersia, they had higher levels of interactions with non-Jewish people, which depended on where they lived, how large the Jewish community was in that city or town or area. Early accepting Jesus as the Christ was largely a Jewish issue in Jewish communities. Then suddenly when non-Jewish people heard about and began to accept the resurrected Jesus Christ, Jewish believers faced the problem of how to relate to and accept believers who had an idolatrous background. So it's hard to build that entire sense of community as we look at this. So it created a huge problem. Jews and idolaters people came from very different religious backgrounds. As examples, Jews believed in the existence of one exclusive God, and idolaters people believed in the existence of many gods, many of whom were not exclusive. The Jews had one temple that was the one place for sacrificial worship, but most idols had numerous temples and numerous places for sacrificial worship. Cultures were different. Traditions were different. Lifestyles were different. Diets were different. Even clothing often had differences. If converted to idol worshipers, they did things the way converted Jews did them that was tolerable. And that commonly was the situation when converted Jews were the larger number. But when converted idol worshipers equaled or outnumbered converted Jews in a city, town, or area, the converted idol worshipers saw no need to do things the way the Jews did. That is, to follow Jewish tra tradition. So if converted idol worshipers did things the way converted Jews did them, that was not tolerable. That was the situation when converted Jews were the larger number. Again, when converted Jew uh, idol worshipers equaled or outnumbered converted Jews in a city or town or area, the converted idol worshiper often saw no need to do things that way. So the situation became more complex. As time passed, converted Jews were ostracized from the synagogue, a Jewish institution, and from the activities of the Jewish community. 
converted idol worshipers were no longer welcome in what were known as associations in many Roman cities. The Roman Empire and local governments became increasingly suspicious of people who would not call Caesar God, who would not worship in temples dedicated to the Roman Caesars, and who would not honor the gods that protected the empire. Increasingly, it became essential that those who believed in the resurrected Jesus Christ accept each other and form a strong sense of community. Christians of radically different backgrounds did not need to fight one another or ostracize one another. So the comments Paul made in Romans 16, 16 to the end of the chapter need to be understood from the perspective of this widespread, very serious problem. In the early church, Christians ate together frequently. One of the first very activities of the very first Christians who were Jewish Christians was eating together. Look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 46. They continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. So well into the first century, Christians eating together was still common, an important activity. Jude spoke of ungodly Christians who abused this practice. Jude verse 12, these are spots in your love feast while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They, they are clouds without water, carried about by the wind, laid autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. Paul mentioned both the practice of Christians eating together and the very real problem Christ Jewish Christians and Gentiles Christians often faced when they ate together. Look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. When Peter had come to Antioch, Paul said, I was stood into his face because he was to be blamed. Verse 12, for before certain men came from uh, James, he would eat with Gentiles, but when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. So this eating together played a powerful, important role in Christians bonding with each other as the community of Christ. So I want to call to your attention the holy kiss mentioned in Romans 16, 16, where he says, greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. But call your attention to that first phrase, that holy kiss. We likely would be very uncomfortable doing things as the early church did them. As I understand it, three things were commonly a part of early church Christian assemblies. And I'm not implying that other things were not a part of their worship, but these were for sure there. The one was the common meal, the love feast, the eating together. It served several purposes. Consider two, it declared to poor Christians who struggled to survive, you are a real part of this community. It built a sustained sense of community. The motive for this meal was not having a feast, but affirming a sense of togetherness. Remember, eating a meal was a common part of sacrificial worship, and they understood the worship of Christians to be sacrificial worship. Jesus is their sacrifice. And eating a memorial meal was an appropriate expression of that worship. Then one, then another one was the holy kiss. I don't know any way of how it was done. A 
a common conclusion was men kiss men, women kiss women, and they likely kissed each other's cheeks. I understand greet one another with a holy kiss is the form of a command and not a suggestion. And, and it's not a sensual kiss, which was quite common in the world in which fornication, adultery, and homosexuality were common. They shared a holy kiss. The purpose was basically the same purpose of the meal, to affirm community and togetherness. One was communion. That was the other thing. So we had this feast they had together. We had this holy kiss, and then we had this, we had communion or Lord's Supper. Remember that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. The fact that it is referred to as the Lord's Supper would indicate a meal, and we saw that it's not actually a meal. We've talked about that before. It's not to sustain your hunger or your thirst. Also remember again that meals were a common part of worship both in the Jewish world and the idolatrous world. And so at some point, this meal affirmed their love for each other. At some point, the holy kiss declared we accept each other, we belong to each other. And at some point, there was the communion or the Lord's Supper that affirmed they could belong to each other and to God because of the sacrifice Jesus made for them. And so the holy kiss. In Romans 16, 16, I also call your attention to the statement, all the churches of Christ salute you. Now, studying this statement, thinking about this statement, I understand that the reference to the church in the New Testament, other than the words the church, are possessive. The church of. The possessions are not names, were not intended as names. They were only used to show relationship. These possessives would include Matthew 16, 18. Jesus said, I'll build my church. The church belongs to me, that is to Jesus. Acts 20, 28, the church of God are the churches belonging to Christ. Mark 16, 16, the church of Christ are churches belonging to Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, chapter 11 and verse 22, chapter 15 and verse 9. The church of God are belonging to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 1. The church of God are belonging to God. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 3. 13, rather, the church of God, or belonging to God. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14. We have there the church belonging to God because of what God did through the sacrifice of Jesus. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 4. The churches of God are the churches belonging to God. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15, the church of the living God are belonging to the living God we have in 1 Timothy 3 verse 15. This same form of possessive is used in reference to a church or churches existing in a geographical area or among, among a people. Romans 16, 14, uh, 4. The churches of the Gentiles is referred to. 1 Corinthians 14.33, the churches of the saints. 1 Corinthians 16.1 and 16.19, the churches of Asia. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 1, the churches of Macedonia. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 2, the churches of Galatia. We see used there in uh, Galatians chapter 1 and verse 22, the churches of Judea. Again, the churches of Judea. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 16, 
the church of the Laodiceans. First Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 1. The church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Second Thessalonians 1 and verse 1. The church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So consistent with the context of the book, the enormous problem between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, Paul said greet each other as genuine members of the Christian community in Rome. And at the same time, remember that you are part of the community of Christians everywhere. They send their greetings. Is what he says. And that's what he says in this particular section of Scripture. Now, to become a part of that Christian community, what must I do to be saved? I must hear the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, John 8 and verse 24. Hebrews 11, 6, without faith it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe he is the reward of them that diligently seek him, and then he exists. Acts 17, verse 30, the time of this ignorance God overlooked now commands all men everywhere to repent. By faith confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God, for with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. These numerous scriptures point out the fact that we're to be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins. Romans 6, 3 through 6, we find out that baptism is a burial. We're united with him in a death like his, that we shall be united with him in a resurrection, in baptism. We're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. As many of you as were baptized in Christ have put on Christ. We find there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female. We're all one in Christ. We're all a part of the community of Christians in this area or whatever area you happen to be. If you're in Christ, you're Abraham's seed and your heirs according to the promise. Colossians 2.12 once again points out baptism is an immersion, a burial. And then we're to continue to live by faith. We're to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing this that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Second Peter 1 and verse 5, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, godliness, brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from becoming ineffective or unfaithful or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. Now, these videos and audios are archived at our website, michaelrhughes.com. That's www. M-I-K-E-A-L-R Hughes.com. There you will find these videos, the note cards that we refer to, and also other Bible material that will help you in your walk with God.